I'm Batman. Well, I hardly think so. The real Cape Crusader calls his crime-fighting cohorts when he's running late. I had to walk. I couldn't get Raj on the back of my scooter. I said this before and I'll say it again. Aquaman sucks. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Geek End. Thank you so much for being with us with the Geek End. And we have several guests tonight. We actually have all four of the Nerd Herd back with us. If you've been watching the show, you remember we used to have Chris, Andrew, and AJ. And we have all four on tonight to discuss this matter that is timely and of utmost importance. Welcome to the program, guys. Thanks for being with us. What's up? Hey, guys. Hello. Hey. So, uh, let's go ahead and dive right into this discussion, because as I'm sure everybody at home knows, the <laughs> most recent Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, the l most recent main entrance to the series, actually just came out on DVD and Blu-ray, and uh, despite my fervent letters, have not yet come out on Disney+, Plus, even though I'm trying to, to work that in, but... I wanted to just kind of go over some of the finer points of this, talk about, you know, because we're all huge Star Wars fans, some of the themes of this movie, some of the things. So this is the thing that I really wanted to start everybody out on. Do you think it's fair to say that J.J. Abrams stuck the landing? I mean, he was in a bad situation, of course, doing the first film, and then another director took over for the second film, and then he kind of had to come back and uh, put together a finale to that series, despite the fact that he didn't have any control over the themes, the story, everything in the eighth movie. So do you think that he kind of wrapped it all up in a, a bow? Do you, how would you grade his performance on that? If we're going to use the analogy of sticking the landing, then I'm going to say it's kind of like where the gymnast comes down and their foot kind of slides out from under them, but then they slide their foot back. And so then they can kind of still stand up at the end. So to me, it wasn't a pretty landing. That's a pretty elaborate analogy, but I like it. It works. <laughs> well, it wasn't, it wasn't a pretty landing, but it was a landing. Um, and I mean, you already highlighted the biggest issue, right? The biggest issue was that they had two directors with two vastly different, I would say conflicting visions and, like, it, it wasn't just that they were moving in different directions. It was that they were moving in opposite directions. Right. They had different ideas of what the franchise should look like. And so having to go one way and then change directions and then change back is very difficult. Um, I think overall he pulled it off. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there were some rough spots. There are some particular either scenes or decisions that just really made no sense to me. But, but yeah, I, I think in general it was, it was a good good finish. So, uh, if I'm characterizing what you're saying correctly, he had a very, very, very tough job and did about as well as you could expect out of him. He did good enough. Yeah. Good I mean, enough. For okay. Me, yeah, for me, I, was, I wasn't I was disappointed. Okay. Uh, what about you, AJ? Well, you can definitely tell me and Chris have been friends for 18 years because... He used the exact analogy that I was going to keep using. Um, <laughs> like a gymnast, you know, going with like a somersault forward and right as the gymnast lands, you know, they hobble a little bit, they stick a foot out. They don't quite get it stuck all the way, but you know, it's just like one tiny flub and then they stand right up and you know, everybody cheers as good as they can. So I was thinking, you know, if we were to rate or grade this, I would probably give it a seven, seven and a half out of 10, all things considered. You can tell by the first 10 or 15 minutes of the movie that he was trying to undo some of the things that The Last Jedi did. You can tell he was rushing through things. A lot of things were brought in and had no explanation, you know, of where they came from, like the light speed jumping thing. Where did that come from? There's no explanation. It's just, that's just a thing now. And um, we had, I had showed you guys a picture uh, right before we started doing this about, um, it was a meme and it showed the, the troopers doing their, their jump thing. And below it, it had um, Poe, yeah, saying, uh, they fly now. And it's, yeah, they fly now. So you could tell that that was a, a bit of a fourth wall moment. He's kind of poking fun at himself, saying, like, you know, where'd that come from? They do that now? Okay, yeah, they do that now. And they just went along with it. 
Yeah. Stuff like that didn't have a whole lot of backstory or it seemed a little convenient. Yeah, I I, th I think that that's fair. And one of the general feelings that I got from it is it felt like they tried to fit about two movies worth of content into one movie. And yeah. uh, I, I say from experience as somebody who sometimes tries to cram about two episodes worth of material into one and it, it just doesn't usually work. Uh, that can be something that's pretty difficult to do. And I think Abrams, uh, that's part of the reason that he utilized so much some of the other media putting aspects of the story, like how Palpatine came back and everything else, how he worked all that into other media and just kind of glossed over it in the movie itself. You know, I hold movies to a ridiculously stupid high standard. And it's probably unfair because, as it's already been mentioned, this particular movie was or this series was one director a different director same director and the stuff that was added in to the last jedi was almost so overwhelming that it overshadowed a lot of the greatness that could have been in this movie mm -hmm. but also one of my biggest problems with it is that i felt like i was watching return of the jedi again like the the ending 30 minutes maybe 40 minutes You've got the fleet flying in and all of a sudden Poe gets there and oh my goodness, it's a trap! And they have to go in and fight and it looks like they're not going to win and then all of a sudden they come out in the end and they win. And it's kind of just like, I've seen this before. Like it was cool the way that the movie ended, like with the fleet coming in and everything, but I don't know. It just, it lacks something. And also it the number of Star Destroyers that they just popped up out of the ground that uh, Palpatine popped out, I didn't like the fact that when those popped out, they were already crude. <laughs> it's like these dudes have just been sitting underground for how long? <laughs> like, a lot of stuff didn't make sense. I'd say 7 or 8 out of 10, yeah. There there were some jumping the shark elements, I think, yeah. that made it a little difficult to, to stay with the entire time. Well, you know, I, I think that one thing that you could kind of go back to because I, I think Andrew made a good point in that he talked about there were times where it really felt like you were watching Return of the Jedi. And it's interesting that in a lot of ways, this movie felt very reminiscent of Return of the Jedi. And there were a lot of ways that Force Awakens felt very much like A New Hope. I mean, I think that that yeah. one's even more painfully obvious. Yeah, that was intentional. Right. But, but you didn't have the second one. But it's interesting that eight is like, you watch that one, you're like, where the crap did that come from? That felt like absolutely <laughs> nothing that's ever been done in the Star Wars universe, no, ever. They did have the at, -AT walkers like in episode five, so they did bring that back. Well, yeah, but... <laughs> that's the only thing. That's like the I only think, thing. Yeah, I think... Um, what I told... Any, some, movie, I went, any movie that makes me uh, miss pod racing. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> So I said this to a couple of coworkers as well. If either director had gotten all three movies, I think both products would have been good. They would have been very different, but they I think they both would have been good. For I, different reasons. It, that's that's sort of a non falsifiable claim, but it's one that I believe. I I, th I think that you're right on that. So let's go ahead and move on to the second question. What did you think about some of the new force powers? Because just watching this, I know that one of the things it brought up was uh, healing because Ray has apparently the ability to heal people very quickly now. I mean, it's not even like you this will heal within a couple of hours when it should be a fatal wound. It was like, oh, you're dying and you're good. I mean, it was just ridiculously fast. So I think that, I don't know, because that's so, because that, power was so overpowered and so drastic, I, I just kind of feel like Jedi in the past would have utilized that if that were an existing force power and it, it worked to that effectiveness. And another thing that I thought was a little bit jarring about the new force powers is matter transference. Granted, we didn't get a whole lot of details on it. It seems like it's really only something Rey and Kylo can do. But... I don't know. They didn't flesh that one out a whole lot. There have been other Jedi with really strong connections to one another, and they've never seemed to be able to do that either. So 
I don't dislike the new force powers, and don't get me wrong, when the uh, lightsaber changed hands like that, that was really cool. But I, I don't... It, it just kind of feels like something that's that new and that different. It, we should have seen that before in the Star Wars universe, especially in the prequels where there's armies of Jedi roaming around. What did y'all think of that one? Chris, you can go ahead and take this one first. So um, I think my answer needs to be split in, into two because the... The matter transfer, that bond, um, I think, is different than everything else that I saw, at least in my mind. So when we when we see this early movie mastering of the Force from from Ray that um, apparently had happened off screen between movies eight and nine, again, we probably would have gotten a, a larger training montage in episode eight had abram's been the director that would have explained some of this it like we said before it seemed kind of convenient it seemed like okay where did all this come from sure she's been reading books but you know really is have you become this powerful this quickly it seems a little hard to believe but see the but books the, thing and i want to just jump in here real quickly the thing about the books i i heard people give that explanation too but i was like these are jedi texts that haven't like been lost for a long time they've evidently been read by most Jedi, and this was information that was around. So again, that brings up the question of why haven't other Jedi used these powers in the past? But anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt there, but continue. Well, and I was also going to mention about this transference thing that we haven't seen before. I actually thought that was a really interesting idea to bring up. Um, and it seemed as though it was something that was more naturally occurring than something you could actually learn how to do. And I actually feel like that merited some more explore, exploration. I thought it, I really liked what they were doing. I kind of wish we'd seen a little bit more to make a little more sense out of it. Well, I, I think that's fair. Um, I'm very much a world building guy. And because I am, I, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm more interested in that aspect of a story than the story itself. So I understand why, from an artistic standpoint, you want to hold off on some of that and, uh, you know, just not necessarily explain every little thing and every little detail. I would have liked to have seen that, but I understand why you have to gloss over some of that. But it, it felt like they were glossing over it, not because they, not because it was something that the story needed, but more like they were glossing over it because they had neither the time nor the desire to explain it. And that's where I think it gets into trouble. The how I rationalized it in my mind was um, playing all the old Star Wars games like Not the Old Republic, Not the Old Republic Two, stuff like that. You had a Force healing power, and your character could train so much in that, and like you know, heal a little bit, heal you know a lot of it, and then heal like a ton with just you know one kind of move. So the Force healing itself wasn't quite new to me. I was rationalizing in my head, like you had said, that she had read it from the Jedi text. And I was thinking that these things had been like, you know, lost or forgotten about forever. And that's what Luke was going to try to find was trying to find these ancient Jedi texts and try to bring them back into like, you know, a curriculum or something. Or and then his little uh, meeting with Yoda there as a force ghost, um, Yoda said that he had read them and page turners. They were not. And then I, I just now thought on my head, you know, Yoda is almost a thousand years old. You know, a thousand years ago, these might have been more well known. But as the time went on, they got lost. And those that did manage to find them or find copies or read them, um, probably, you know, they were probably boring reads. They were probably very technical, probably very dry. So people who started trying to read these texts got like, you know, a few pages or a few chapters in and just stopped. And your force healing powers and your force uh, matter transfer might have been towards like the end, like some kind of advanced powers. Um, that's how I, I rationalize the healing part in my head. I'll, I'll be honest. I, I have a hard time buying that for two reasons. First of all, you have to remember that for the Jedi, this was their whole life. Like when you, when a Jedi child becomes a Jedi, they study it from then on for their entire life. And usually a Jedi's lifespan is even longer than a normal life, be, uh, you know, uh, life, uh, what, life form of their species. I don't know why I was having trouble with that. But beyond that, and I think that this may be even more important, if Yoda remembered those and remembered those texts, wouldn't he have just transcribed them? I mean, maybe he couldn't have transcribed them perfectly, but it seems like him being a Jedi Grand Master for nearly a thousand years could have, you know, passed those skills along. So 
I'm not saying it's a terrible justification, but it's it's a bit of a stretch. If you read some of the the Wikipedia articles, you know those are like the Jedi or the Star Wars Wikipedia things. Mm. Um, they noted that Yoda was a Jedi consular, and then even in some of the video games like Knights of the Republic, right. consular more you know force focused and you know focused on healing and those kind of things. So yeah, you're you're probably right there. Um, Yoda probably could have transcribed them or at least like you know written a, a force for dummies kind of yeah. <laughs> Which, honestly, I would read. I think that's actually not a bad idea. I don't know. A lot has been unpacked so far. The the whole, what do you call it, force transfer- transference Trans- or whatever? Transference, yeah. don't like it. I'm just going to leave it at that. I, I, don't, I think it's weird that only those two could do it. So I, I'm not a fan of that, that. I mean, I know that they need to introduce some more stuff, but I feel like they could have elaborated or expanded, I guess would be a better word, on a lot of the stuff that was already in there. Uh, I'm glad to see that Ray threw a lightsaber and was able to pull it back like a boomerang. That was a nice addition. Um, the healing thing, I- I'm kind of like with AJ on it because I feel like they called it the sacred Jedi text, which means that maybe the younglings and the Jedi Knights might not have studied it. It might have been only there for like the masters. But then again, uh, Mace Windu didn't ever mention or have those. He could have saved himself. You know, he could have lived. He had had a healing power, I guess. I don't yeah, know, but maybe. Uh, I, I've, I've I go back even further to um, to what is the last movie? The Last Jedi. My goodness, <laughs> I go back to the Last Jedi, and I wasn't a fan. I know I love uh, Princess Leia to death. I think that she's a great character. I love the fact that they brought out her Jedi side and uh, the last. Uh, the, Rise of Skywalker, but to see her come out with some abs- absurd power to be blowing and fl- blown out of her spaceship, flying hundreds of miles away, and then all of a sudden she wakes up from a coma. Is like, here we go, boom! We're gonna pull ourselves right back into this ship. Like, really? No Jedi's ever had that kind of strength before, and she gets it. Uh, I don't know. Well, I'm now, just... now, granted, that is a force power from a different movie. But uh, I think my... I'm just saying, like, that ruined it for me. No, like, I, 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 that's fair. Uh, I think my favorite take on that was, I think I was watching the Honest trailer for The Last Jedi, <laughs> and she does the force pull thing, and she goes, yeah, I'm Carrie Poppins, y'all. That was perfect. <laughs> that's great. Uh, all right, that's a good note to end on, so we'll go ahead and ask this one. How do you feel they handled the balance between old and new characters? Because... Personally, mm-hmm. just from my take on it, I think it leaned way too heavy into the new characters because they can't help that Carrie Fisher died. So I give them a pass on that one. Like, that's not their fault. But when it comes to having Han Solo killed off in the first movie, I think that J.J. Abrams probably regrets that. And when it comes to Luke being gone, again, that was out of his control. But... Chewbacca basically only serves as a plot device and R2-D2 barely plays a role in this movie at all. You're pretty much left with just the new cast. And with the exception of Ray, to be honest, I don't really care about the new cast. I don't really care about any of the new characters. And that was one thing that really hurt the movie for me. Uh, Luke's force ghost moment is probably my favorite scene in the entire movie. And, you know, Lando, I, I like to see that he was involved. The only old character that I think really shined in this movie, C-3PO. This may be C-3PO's best movie. C-3PO's comic timing was just spot on the entire time. So oddly enough, C-3PO, an older character that I've never been a huge fan of, I've just always kind of been lukewarm on, I thought that they handled his character about as well as any of them. I'm kind of in the same boat that you are. I don't care that much about the new cast. Like, I understand when they were, you know, announcing episodes seven, eight, and nine, they were trying to set up a passing of the torch thing so you could focus on the new cast, but they handled, you know, things a lot differently than what we thought, made a lot of missteps, and it made us not care that much about the new cast. And we were wanting to see more of the old cast. I know personally, I was hoping in this movie we would see, um, Leia actually using her lightsaber and not in the, just the, the flashback scene where she's training with Luke. I was hoping we'd like, you know, see her use it and wield it and, you know, fight Kylo, fight the Emperor mm-hmm. or somebody. I don't know. But, of course, we didn't really get that. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, I liked how they did C-3PO. Uh, something me and my wife, Danielle, talked about often before this movie came out was how much people just don't listen to him. And he actually has some valuable things to say and some good input if somebody would just you know give him five minutes and let him talk. But they never did. And I feel like they amplified that even much more in this movie and kind of made it a point to, you know, make C-3PO a, a vital part of the plot. Mm-hmm. Um, what really disturbed me with his character in this movie was how right before um, Babu Frick was about to, you know, do the the memory wipe thing and make him start, you know, speaking the Sith language was he was saying, I'm taking a, a last look at my friends. Oh, are you talking about the people that you've known for like, you know, a few <laughs> months, maybe? What about, you know? Later yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with that. That line doesn't make a lot of sense. It would exactly. it would have made sense if he said, uh, my friends, Luke and R2-D2. <laughs> like, just <gone. laughs> That would have made a lot more sense. But that, that line really didn't fit in that spot. That, that was pretty much it for me as far as he was concerned. Everywhere else, he was golden. Yeah, and, and you know he's also literally golden. So, yeah. <laughs> but but no, I, I think that's fair. And one thing that I forgot to mention that I'm glad AJ brought up is that he, the only new character I think I really like is Babu Frick. So, <laughs> <laughs> Babu Frick and Dio. And and uh, even though this is the last, you know, the last Jedi, uh, I really like the Porgs. I think that they were a good new addition. Oh. They were just another hash of the Ewoks. I don't, I don't like them. I, but I like them a lot better than the Ewoks. But anyway, all right, uh, Andrew, where did you fall on this one? I, I hated it, but I hated it not because of Rise of Skywalker, necessarily. I hated the fact that The Last Jedi threw in all these new characters. They even killed off some of the new characters in the same movie. And then... They disappear. Oh, you mean like the, the uh, Admiral's sacrifice that no one cares about because we've only seen her on screen for a grand total of seven minutes in the entire movie? Yeah, that made no sense to me. She came out of nowhere. I'm sure she's somewhere in Star Wars lore somewhere, but she just came up out of nowhere in that movie and was gone. Then all like the huge characters that were in that movie, we don't see most of them in the next movie. They either died or they're just, they have smaller roles. Uh the girl that's like and says that she loves uh, Finn, she has such a small role in this movie. Like it's almost like they left her at the wayside, and he picked up the new girlfriend uh, that was on the planet where the, uh, I guess the old Death Star had fallen. So I, I didn't understand that. I didn't like how all of these minor characters were so minor, but the major characters were almost just as minor. Like the ones that we grew up loving weren't really that big i think my favorite part of the whole stinking movie was uh the scene where wedge antilles gets three seconds of fame in the millennium falcon and i stood up and cheered in the theater i was so (laughs) happy for that 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 was a nice little nostalgia moment and in that moment where they have a bunch of references they have a bunch of different ships i thought that was really cool you see the ghost from star wars rebels and some of the others but one thing that you brought up that i really wanted to, to touch on here for just a second um, when it, when it comes to some of these, I think that they tried to make the cast too big and this isn't as much specific to rise of Skywalker as it is this entire new trilogy. They kind of ran into the same problem that they did with the original X-Men movies that they tried to cram so many different characters in as nostalgia bait. And in this trilogy, they also tried to cram a whole bunch of new characters in as well that you you wind up not caring about any of them because even the main characters don't get enough screen time to really be developed. And so I think that that was an issue that they ran into. They tried to do too much. And the thing that's really cool about the original trilogy of Star Wars is really there's only like, what, seven, eight characters, honestly, like that have multiple lines and are actually developed. And I think mm-hmm. keeping the focus tightly on that tiny group of characters makes a real difference here. Well, I was going to say, the reason that you don't really care for the new characters as much is because the movie where they would have had character development, episode eight, didn't develop the new characters. There was no character development. Your hotshot fighter pilot sat on a ship for two and a half hours while your ex-stormtrooper was running around in the casino for no good reason and then hopping on whatever 
creatures and racing them around or rescuing them or something. There was no character development, so you never really got attached to them. You got introduced to them. We had this good promise, and then they did nothing with them. And yeah, so and, I think and, was... and I would say Finn's big character building opportunity, his big moment was the sacrifice scene where Rose knocks him out of it at the tail end of it anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's I agree with you, yeah. It's unfortunate because I think there's a whole lot of potential with the cast they did bring together. I actually did like most of the characters, but they just didn't really do enough with them to build them into the the Mark Hamill, you know, and the Harrison Ford of, of another generation. Yeah. And I think when they when they came out and said that they weren't planning on continuing at least to my knowledge, continuing with this cast doing more Star Wars movies, again, there's no buy in or attachment because okay, the movies are over, they're done. You know, their job is over. You're not going to see them anymore. So I think that's part of it. Um, I think also I like what they tried to do with the nostalgia. I appreciated it. But especially Lando and bringing him in, I, th- I kind of cringed when they tried to introduce him because it seemed very forced. And then when he magically shows up at the end after saying he wouldn't, again, convenient, forced, and just didn't really land very well. I guess maybe I didn't have as big a problem with that. And I know that there's going to be so many people in the comment section that are just uh, throwing venom at me for saying this. Maybe the reason I wasn't disappointed in Lando is because I didn't expect much out of Lando. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no offense, but Lando's like real low on my uh, list of favorite Star Wars characters. So maybe that's the reason that I liked Lando's appearance and you didn't is I wasn't expecting a whole lot. Well, but he had, there had been hype built up for him coming back. And the way they did it was just, again, ham-fisted, too quick, too convenient. Um, I think, uh, again, I, I think it was a pretty good movie all around, but I do think there were a lot of missed opportunities as far as character development. I think that's fair, because I got to say, I think that the premise of a ex-stormtrooper defecting and and going over to the the light side of the force and all i mean there's all kinds of great potential with that and they used literally none of it like finn is the most boring character (laughs) basically his entire character is he used to be a stormtrooper every aspect Mm -hmm. about him every plot point every conversation he has is about hey i used to be a stormtrooper now i'm not it's a good premise but you have to build on the premise. You can't just let the premise sit by itself. And that's, I think, where they uh, ran out of, of opportunity there, like you were talking about. Yeah, I think the best example of this issue, at least in my mind, was sitting in episode eight. In the first, what, 10, 15 minutes, we have this really cool space battle. And Poe's flying around and doing all these stunts and tricks. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be great. And he never gets in a ship again. <laughs> Good point. And that's his character. He's the hot shot pilot and he doesn't get back in a ship. You know, it's, it's funny too, because they did that a little more in rise of Skywalker, but uh, Poe has surprisingly few scenes throughout this trilogy where he's actually piloting a craft. Yeah. And they promised so much in the first movie. Remember he's flying around his X-wing shooting all these TIE fighters and doing flips and stunts. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of promise there. Yeah. All right, so for and, and the last question of the evening that I wanted to go over, how do you feel about Ray's name change? And personally, this is just my take on it. You guys may completely disagree with me, and that's fine. But when it came to the final scene where Ray has the, the new lightsaber and says that her name's Ray Skywalker... I think that kind of cut against absolutely everything that I felt the film was building to. And I don't mind the name change in a vacuum, but what kills me is the entire buildup, her entire story was basically, I thought the theme of it was, it doesn't matter who you're related to, what matters is the choices that you make. And I love that message. I thought that that message was fantastic. But if that's the case then changing her name basically is a slap in the face to that message. Uh, Her saying that her name is Skywalker and not Palpatine is basically saying, no, it does matter who you're related to, and so I'm going to hide the fact that I'm a Palpatine. I'm going to shy away from that and embrace the name of Skywalker, basically covering it up and trying to associate myself with different people. Now, 
maybe I don't know, I'm reading too much into that or whatever. And I understand that to make the catchy title Rise of Skywalker, they had to figure out some kind of way to make that uh, make that make sense. But ultimately, I thought that was the dumbest thing they could have done. I, I felt that that cut against everything that had been building up to Ray's character. I mean, I didn't think much of it. I kind of figured it was coming because we knew because of Carrie Fisher's death that that Skywalker was over. Right. Technically, she is solo. But anyway, um, so we knew Maybe that she's that, progressive uh, and didn't say his name. Her last name. <laughs> <laughs> but like we knew that she was gone. We knew from episode eight that Luke was gone. There was no other Skywalker that was going to be coming around. A- Anakin's gone. I mean, like all the Skywalkers are dead. And at the beginning, uh, right before they met Lando, that uh, that native asked her, what's your name? What's your family name? And uh, she said that she didn't have one. I was like, I see that where this is going. Like, and from that point on, I was like, okay, at some point she's going to call herself Skywalker. It's just, it just is what it is. So, I mean, I didn't, I didn't really care. I didn't really think much into it because, I mean, it was what you just brought up was really solid points, you know, about how the whole series, she's been trying to be her own person, even like she's been trying to come into who she is. And now it's all of a sudden, oh, I don't like where I came from. We're going to change that. Which so, honestly I mean, is a very millennial thing to do. It is. So. <laughs> I didn't like it. I really, <laughs> like Andrew said, you you kind of see it coming from, you know, a mile away. And mm. then it actually happens and you're still, no matter how much you brace yourself for it, you still kind of cringe with it. Um, it's like you said, she spent this whole time, you know, thinking she's a nobody that all of a sudden she's somebody, but she's not happy with who she actually is. So she tries to go with being somebody else instead of making, you know, good of the name that she actually is. Uh, I wasn't a huge fan of it. Well, now I'll I'll say this sort of as a a response to what you were saying, I actually, and, and maybe this would have been a better way to talk about the question as well. I like the fact that they made her Palpatine's granddaughter. Like, I thought that that actually enhanced the story greatly. It actually gave her a personality, which she was sorely lacking up to this point. Um, It gives her a backstory, and it helps explain, for one, why she can beat Kylo Ren in The the Force Awakens, despite having never touched a lightsaber in her entire life. Uh, it, It did actually help explain some things in the story, and I think helped make Rey a much better character, It just kills me that the name change at the end is basically a slap in the face to all of that. But that was my take on it. It's a minor thing, but it's a minor thing that really irritates me. Chris, what was your take on it? My take is you need to find some uh, guests with different opinions than yours. (laughs) Um, Because, I mean, what, what you said summarized how I felt is that at the end of the movie, it seems like it was all everything that, that, that they had worked as far, again, character progression everything that they worked towards, they undercut, you know? They yeah. And, and I was genuinely expecting uh, the answer at the end to be just Ray or something like that to, to, to decline to give a last name because she's going to make something of herself instead. And, and they, they didn't do it. Um, and it was, it was a bummer too, because it kind of ended on a, a sour note for me too, because it's pretty much the end of the movie, right? Right. Um, the the end of the movie, the end of the trilogy, and I had actually, like I said, th- there's a lot of things I like about this movie. I think it's by far the strongest one in this trilogy, but ending it on that note, that did put a sour taste in my mouth at the tail end of the movie and at the tail end of the entire trilogy, which, I don't know, I just don't understand why they made that decision. I was wondering whether they would do some sort of Ben... Uh, not switcheroo because he's a solo, not a Skywalker. But I was wondering if they would somehow, you know, make him carry on that lineage and take up Luke's, you know, mantle of, of teaching the next generation. But of course, that didn't happen either. Um, so yeah, yeah, instead I, he he just died and got to make out with Ray right before that happened, which also felt really weird. But but not in that order. Yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that would have been super it. creepy. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Ah. But yeah, same, same thoughts from me. A final take to wrap it up. I'll, I'll give a 
quick summary of, of some of my final thoughts, but because I know some of these questions are very specific and pointed, just as in, in general, uh, what were some of your takeaways from this and, and some of the things that you, uh, just, just sort of a sum up of how you felt about the movie overall? Like we said at the start, there were definitely some, some missteps. You could tell he spent the first 15 minutes trying to undo and patch up stuff from The Last Jedi to make sense of the rest of the movie, which he did as best as he could. Um, overall, I, like I said, with the, the stick in the landing thing, I give it a, probably a seven, seven and a half, all things considered. Um, definitely not as bad as it could have been, but it's not also as good as it could have been. It's what I've been waiting for, and that is just a Star Wars movie, like a, a trilogy Star Wars movie, so I've been waiting for that. One thing that I need to give credit to these guys on is something that, to me, is is part of the nostalgia, obviously, but it's also something that I think that the movie series needed to do because changing it also wouldn't have made any sense, uh, and it also probably would have ticked off a lot of people. But the ships in the movie are so great they they don't introduce a, i mean except for the final battle scene obviously that where these ships come out of everywhere but as for the republic or the rebel fleet or the resistance fleet or whatever it's been for the past <laughs> six movies uh the ships have all been the same they've been x-wings who's who's the the awesome pilot what does he pilot he pilots an x-wing uh when they go into the uh final attack to or, go after or if you're Emperor, watching last jedi nothing that too. <laughs> it, 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 I love anything, but I love my, probably one of the armchair. best armchair. <laughs> uh, I think probably my my second favorite scene, aside from Wedge uh, and his scene, is when they're taking off to go follow Ray to the planet at the very end. Mm. The first ship that you see take off looks just like the Tantive Four, which was Princess Leia's ship that she uh, escaped from at the end of Rogue One and was tracked down on at the start of A New Hope. It looked just like it. It was a uh, Karelian cruiser. And you get to see that along with all the X-Wings, just like at the Battle of Yavin 4. All of them take off. All of them go up into the sky to fight this massive battle. And that was something that I needed to see. I, I, I can't hate a movie because of the little things that... Well, I can hate Episode 8. I can't hate Episode 9. <laughs> <laughs> I think... You know what? I almost, and I'm going to give Chris a chance to talk, and I'm going to talk after this too, but I almost want to end the entire video on that line just because if there's anything that sums up my thoughts on this movie, I don't I don't hate 9. I hate episode 8. Hate on 8. But anyway. Uh, Chris, what were your thoughts on this? What were your final thoughts? So so I had a, a debate with coworkers before episode 9 actually came out. And we were going back and forth on seven and eight and Abrams versus Johnson. And my point was Star Wars as a franchise. Okay. So some movie franchises are museums, right? They're artistic. They do these interesting and challenging things. And some movie franchises are amusement park rides. Okay. So Star Wars is an amusement park ride. It's not a, it's not a museum. Right, you go to a Star Wars movie because you're, it's like riding on a roller coaster. It's not because you're going to critique something. So, like we've been pretty critical tonight, but I still really enjoyed the movie because it was fun. It had the nostalgia trip. It had the all the things that I came expecting, and it delivered on those things. So, I still got my amusement park ride out of it because that's the kind of franchise that, that I have come to expect um, Star Wars to be. So. You know, I guess as I was saying, this, despite us sounding kind of negative so far, I did still enjoy it. It still was a lot of fun. They stumbled in a few places, but they had their hearts in the right place to wrap it up. I do think a trilogy of Episode Eight's um, story intent also would have been interesting, but it was set up for failure because Episode Seven had such a different tone. It never really would have worked. So having to retcon those things and everything kind of dragged episode nine down a little bit. Yeah. By the way, is your wife just like throwing silverware in the sink back there? Because that's what it sounds uh, like. <laughs> doing dishes. <laughs> but no. Um, overall, I'm I'm kind of with you on that. I I do like the movie in a lot of ways. 
I, I don't think it's terrible. I, there's a lot to love about it. Like I said before, I think it's by far the strongest entry in this trilogy. I, I think that in a lot of ways, Abrams did the best that he could with the bad situation. And, you know, maybe it doesn't wind up being a 10, but considering that, you know, where he had to start out with and what he had to work with, I think that it's a Herculean effort. Uh, my biggest complaints are probably because uh, all three of you could answer this very easily. What's my favorite part of any Star Wars movie? <laughs> Lightsaber duels. Yeah. And there's Sword not Wars. a good one in this movie. And that's what kills me. Even though I really dislike eight, the one thing that I will say in eight's favor is that the, the, the lightsaber combat is significantly better, especially in the throne room scene. Uh, Knights of Ren was another missed opportunity for something like that. Yeah. And there, there is probably the best fight in this entire movie is the scene on the water planet between Kylo and, and Ray. Um, but I was really expecting at the end for the whole Palpatine thing not to be like basically a force ghost battle, but actually be a, a lightsaber duel. And it just never turned into that. Uh, so that was a little disappointing. Uh, and ultimately there were some other issues with the film, but you know, when, when you, when you peel all of the details back and all of my minor annoyances with it and ask what a star Wars movie is, and it being about those themes, the eternal struggle between light and darkness. I think that this movie does a really good job of putting that on display. I would like to see it put on display with a shiny lightsaber duel going on as well. But I think that overall, when you sort of ask that question, what is a, a Star Wars movie supposed to be? I think this one pretty much fits the bill. Uh, I don't think that it's going to be, you know, remembered as the greatest Star Wars movie of all time. But I think this one winds up being one of the better ones, honestly. All right. So thanks guys so much for being with us tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll have, I'm sure several conversations about Star Wars in the future. I'm even thinking about doing one, uh, not too long from now, like basically where does Star Wars go from here? But that's another time for another subject. So we're going to go ahead and close it out. I appreciate it. Stay the course. friends. <laughs> Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.